Hi everybody, it's really important for your macroeconomics exams that you have a detailed knowledge of what's happening in the UK economy and that you can quote stats to help you analyse, evaluate and write a judgement effectively. So make sure all the things on the boards you write down and you also write down everything that I'm saying so that you know how to use these stats in your essays. We'll start by looking at growth and unemployment in the UK before we look at other macroeconomic objectives and the data to accompany them. Current annual growth rate in the UK is at 2.1%, but we still have a negative output gap. The Bank of England quotes it to be around minus 0.3% of GDP, implying there is still some slack in the economy. The economy can grow without much demand pull inflationary pressure right now. Quarterly growth rate is at 0.4%, quoting uh, the first quarter of this year. That was much lower than expected. Lower retail sales, because of bad weather, yes, but because of also fears over what might happen if the UK leaves the European Union and how that's kind of put a halt to consumer spending right now. Forecasted growth rate annually over the next four years is, is expected to be 2%. That is assuming the UK stays within the EU. Real GDP per capita, know that figure of £29,000. And the breakdown of GDP is very, very important when it comes to evaluation. Total GDP in the UK is £453 billion or £4.53 trillion. But the breakdown is significant. 79% of our GDP is still coming from services, 14% only for manufacturing, 6% construction, 1% agriculture. And that tells you how unbalanced the UK economy is, how reliant we are on services, specifically financial services, for growth. That means the UK economy is in a very weak position if we suffer another global economic shock. Very good for evaluation knowing those stats. What about unemployment? Unemployment rate right now is 5.1%, the lowest it's been since the financial crisis. Great news. The full employment level is around 4.7%. Prominent economists put it around that. So it's still a little bit uh, to go until we get unemployment rates at the full employment level. But still very, very good right now, 5.1%. Youth unemployment at 13.2%, good. Relatively low compared to the rest of Europe, where youth unemployment rates are much higher. But the UK government is not too happy with this wants it to come down even further. Hence, there is a lot of curriculum reform right now. Um, there is a lot of promotion of apprenticeship schemes, these supply-side reforms to improve education to get this youth unemployment rate down. Long-term unemployment of 1.5% is excellent. Consumer confidence linking to unemployment has increased significantly as the unemployment rate has fallen over the last two years. But more recently, consumer confidence is not so high. It's actually slowing down because of fears over what might happen if the UK leaves the European Union. And also worth knowing what's been happening to income tax rates, income tax bans, linking that to unemployment. George Osborne has been raising the tax-free allowance since he's come into power, and it currently stands at £11,000. So your first £11,000 of income is not taxed at all. And that's very helpful for individuals uh, to gain an incentive to enter the labour force, to find work, further helping to reduce the unemployment rate. So that's growth and unemployment, let's move into inflation and the balance of payments. Current CPI inflation in the UK is at 0.5%. That is a March figure. In the next couple of days, the April figure is going to come out. So chances are, by the time you're watching this video, you're going to have more up-to-date figure for inflation. But you can see 0.5, whatever it is going to be, the next one, is going to be much, much, much below what the central bank are targeting, much below the 2% target rate of inflation. And why is the inflation rate so low? It's been driven by three major factors. Food prices, we can see, is in deflation right now. Uh, food prices are coming down, and that's heavily reducing the overall inflation figure. Oil prices are also very low, and that's leading to lower fuel prices at the pumps. Uh, oil prices were $125 per barrel in 2012. Now they stand at only $43 per barrel, and that's really bringing down fuel prices. Um, but also gas and electricity prices are falling as well, all of which is leading to a very low CPI inflation figure. But that is being heavily distorted by those three factors, and we know that if we look at the core inflation rate, which stands at 1.5%. Excellent to know this for evaluation. Core inflation is the CPI inflation rate, but stripping out food prices, uh, fuel prices, and gas and electricity prices, taking out these uh, items that are very prone to volatility, very prone to price swings and thus distorting the overall inflation figure. We can see that the underlying inflation rate is 1.5%, much, much more healthy, much closer to target. That's generally what's happening with prices, a good one 
for you to quote so that you know that if there is deflation uh, in the medium term, let's say, that's not going to be a bad thing for the economy because it's being driven by these three supply side factors, which are short term. Producer price inflation can be used to forecast future inflation as a forward looking indicator of inflation. It measures um, prices, wholesale prices, as goods leave the factory before they actually enter retail shops. And we can see that producer price inflation again is negative, deflation there implying that wholesale prices are actually falling, meaning that input prices must be falling. We know they are. Food prices are falling, uh, fuel prices are falling, gas electricity costs are falling, which is bringing down uh, wholesale prices of goods as they leave the factory. So the fact this is negative implies that the inflation rate going forward is unlikely to increase significantly. It's likely to stay below target for the medium term. Real earnings, good signs, it's picking up at 2.2%, much, much higher than it has been in the past since the financial crisis. Good signs in the three months of February, 2.2% rise in real earnings. And house price inflation, worth knowing, is currently at 5.3%. That's a sign of a very weak housing market, actually. A significant lack of supply of housing in the UK economy, despite strong demand. Let's now move into the balance of payments. Some horrible figures here for the UK economy. Important you know these to weigh them up in your essays. Our current account deficit is massive at around 5.2% of GDP. Horrible. And that has been driven by a huge trade deficit. We are importing way more goods and services than we're exporting of goods and services. And the reason for that is poor productivity and very poor investment. These are the driving factors as to why. We had the worst uh, trade deficit figures since 2008 published recently. Our trade deficit stands at 13.3 billion pounds. Horrible, horrible, horrible figures. A sign that the economy is not rebalancing at all. However, there are signs that this may improve because the pound is becoming weaker against our major currencies like the euro and the dollar, uh, economies that we trade a lot with. Uh, currently, the pound is one euro. Uh, one pound is equal to one euro twenty and one pound is equal to one dollar fifty, much weaker than it has been of late. And that is again uh, due to worries over what might happen if the UK leaves the European Union and lots of selling of the pound as a result of a lack of confidence in the UK economy right now. Uh, with a weaker pound though, our exports become cheaper and that should help us to improve our trade deficit right now. And especially if the Eurozone economy, our biggest trading partner, is growing. And the signs are that it is growing and it's expected to grow further into 2016. Expected growth rates of 1.6%. So maybe in the medium term again we might see some improvements in our trade data, but still horrible trade figures. Let's now move into government finances and generally other things that are going on in the UK economy. You can see that the UK government is still running a very large budget deficit of 3.8% of GDP despite George Osborne's attempts through austerity to bring that down and to get into a budget surplus. He's promised a budget surplus by 2020, but budget deficit of around £72 billion a year. That's still a lot of money um, in terms of a budget deficit, a long way to go until we reach a surplus. That is translating into a very large national debt. Make sure you know the difference between the budget deficit and the national debt. But national debt, i.e. the total stock of debt held by the UK government, is around 84% of GDP, so still very high. These are great stats for you to quote, uh, to worry about the state of UK government finances and therefore whether certain uh, macroeconomic policies are viable or not, given how much debt the UK government is in right now. However, borrowing for the UK government is really cheap, so therefore financing the debt is not too bad. Bond yields uh, for the UK government uh, is around 1.5% on average. Uh, it's worth also knowing what the current tax rates are for the biggest tax receipts for the UK government. Income tax bans we've already looked at. Okay, There is a tax-free allowance on the first £11,000 of income held. So that's no percent tax on your first £11,000. Then 20% uh, from 11000 up to 43000 40% from 43000 up to 150000 And any income earned above 150000 you're taxed at 45%. Corporation tax sits at 20% right now, although Osborne again has planned for that to come down uh, by 17% to 2020. Uh, but next year, 19%, the year after, 18%, and by 2020, it will come down to 17%. VAT stands at 20% right now. Uh, income inequality, worth knowing some nice stats about the UK's distribution of income. Our Gini coefficient is 0.32. Remember, for a Gini, 
The closer the figure is towards zero, the better it is in terms of the distribution of income, the more equal the distribution of income is. So that might look good, but if we look at the relative income inequality for the UK, uh, compared to OECD averages, we are well above the OECD average of income inequality, very unequal compared to other OECD countries, way above the average. Uh, on top of that, in the G7, we are one of the worst performing nations when it comes to the distribution of income. So a highly unequal uh, economy, especially the north-south divide, London compared to the rest of the UK, significant income inequality there, not a good thing at all. What about interest rates and generally what's going on with monetary policy? The central bank interest rate is 0.5%. It's been that for seven years. A sign of real weakness in the economy that we need cheap credit, we need debt-fueled growth for our growth to be maintained, not a good sign at all. Uh, average quoted mortgage rates is at 2%, and that tells you that the transmission mechanism isn't perfect, nice for evaluation, although mortgage rates have come down significantly. Consumer confidence, as we've said, has been increasing significantly over the last two years, but more recently has weakened because of fears of potential Brexit, exit from the European Union. Great evaluation here of monetary policy, the willingness to lend, to individuals, i.e. by mortgages and general loans, that has improved over time. But for businesses, it's extremely poor. Uh, businesses, small and medium enterprises, are still finding it very hard to get loans. In fact, if we look at lending stats for businesses, small businesses, medium businesses, the trend is very, very downward. Not a good sign there. And you can therefore uh, question the effectiveness of very, very loose monetary policy. The amount of quantitative easing, the amount of money pumped into the economy stands at £375 billion. That's not going to increase anytime soon. Good stats for you to know. Um, we're also now going to look at some really important supply side policies that the UK government has announced which can really be useful in your essays. Let's see some of those. These are some awesome supply side policies for you to target some of the problems in the stats you've all written down but also for you to use in your essays in terms of what might happen in the future to the UK economy. We can break these supply side policies down into investment promoting supply side policies and policies that encourage more competition and that free up markets. Let's look at policies that uh, the UK government has adopted to encourage more long term investment. Well, big reforms to the tax system, uh, especially in terms of corporation tax. The cuts that I've talked about are very important in promoting more investment. Policies that encourage long-term investments, such as the annual tax-free allowance, uh, money that can be put aside which is not going to be taxed as long as it's used for investment. Up to £200,000 is the tax-free allowance right now. Significant policy to encourage investment. Uh, policies to uh, improve the skills of the workforce and to make the workforce more flexible. Reforming school curriculum at primary and secondary level. A lot of that going on right now. But also big, big, big moves to encourage more apprenticeships out there in the economy. Transport uh, related policies are big right now. The UK government has committed to spending up to £110 billion on transport infrastructure by 2021. That includes things like high speed rail, that includes improving airport capacity, that improves spending, that includes spending on roads. These kind of transport related expenditures uh, we are looking at. That again will help the efficiency of the economy. And the UK government is committed to improving digital infrastructure, allowing everybody, individuals and businesses, to access superfast broadband and 4G networks. What about our free market policies? Well, the UK government is committed to easing planning permission, especially for building of new houses. That can significantly reduce costs and make it much, much easier to do business, to build, etc., to expand. You might have heard this quote of higher pay and a lower welfare society, something George Osborne and David Cameron are significantly promoting. How are they doing that? Well, lower welfare, they're trying to cap benefits and higher pay, they're trying to increase the minimum wage to get to a national living wage by 2020 of between nine and 10 pounds an hour. To improve the com competition in markets, the UK government is cutting red tape and is making it easier for consumers to switch suppliers for things like internet, for things like water supplies, gas supplies, electricity supplies, making it easier to switch, encouraging more competition that way. They're also trying to encourage more trade, the march of the makers policies you might have heard about. To diversify the economy, to rebalance the economy away from a reliance on, on services and more towards manufacturing, towards exports for balance. They're doing that by especially encouraging more free trade agreements right now. 
And just generally, they want the economy to be more balanced, less dependent on London, less dependent on financial services. The way they're doing that is by devolution policies, allowing councils all around the country to have more control over their budgets and how they spend their money to help to rebalance the economy and make some of these northern sectors more powerful. The northern powerhouse you might have heard about is what George Osborne is trying to promote. Uh, less power on London and more of that power being spread around the economy. So you've got all the stats you need, you've got some key policies here as well. Use them in your essay, understand them, understand why they can be really powerful in bolstering your essay. Really, really good luck for your exams, guys. I know you can smash it. Hopefully now with this really, really key detail, you can hit those top, top marks. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all next time.